Okay, so for those of you who uh, finished answering the poll, I'm going to give a little introduction to today's topic. It's not quite time, but I'm going to start on the background because it's kind of a lot to squeeze into an hour, and I'm worried that I, I might run out of time. I'm doing two pages. Sometimes I just do one page, one document, but today I'm going to try to do a diploma or a, the equivalent of a diploma and then a grade report. Not really a report card, but more a, a report of um, a performance on a test. And it's the kind of thing that I get a lot of from people who have gone to high school or preparatoria or some secondary school in Latin America, and now they're coming to community college in the US. And on their application, they have to submit a certified translation of their grade report. And it's different depending on what country you lived in and depending on what level of school you completed. And so today is just a sample. And I hopefully that a lot of the topics that come up in the course of this translation will be useful for other kinds of translations that you're hired to do. And in a setting like this, we're not supposed to recommend any kind of um, cost or fee structure because in our industry, we're afraid of price fixing in the United States. Um, but I can say that this kind of translation is something that I would do for $50 a page. And it's a two page translation, so I would charge $100 for it. And it would probably take two or three hours to do, unless it was real similar to one that I'd done before, in which case I'd pull out the old one I'd done before and just change it to correspond to the new person. And that would make it faster and save some of the setup time. But today I'm going to pretend like it's one that I've never seen before and I'm starting from scratch so that you can see all the steps that go into setting up the format. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results if you're curious. Uh, question number one, you have to have a certified, you have to be a certified translator to sign a translator certification in the US. The answer is false. There is no government credential in the US to be a certified translator. Anybody over age 18 can sign a translator certification and they may or may not be qualified to do it, but it's an unregulated practice, an unregulated profession. Uh, number two, certified translations of academic documents need to be notarized in the US. The answer is false. Um, very few, I can't think of a single university that has ever asked us to notarize our certified translations. Um, we just sign it and we put it on company letterhead and we have a company seal that we stamp on it, but it's not an official requirement. That's just the format that we've come up with at Texan Translation. Uh, number three, you have to have a degree in translation and a government credential to be a professional translator. That's false in the United States. There is none. There is no government credential. For translation, there is for interpretation in a legal setting, and there's a credential that the American Translators Association issues to people who've passed their tests, but that's not a government agency. And you don't have to have any degree in particular. A lot of um, certified translations are prepared by people who have an associate's degree in you know, computer science or something unrelated, but they've developed the skills to translate. And that's not ideal, you know, it's, this is a, a profession, a sort of a nascent profession, a profession that's in its early stages of development. Maybe in another generation that will be more formalized. Number four, there is one objective correct translation for everything. No, this is kind of a philosophical question, but I think that there's always a dozen ways to translate anything and some are more appropriate for one context and some for another. But this is an art and not a science that we're working on. Number five, there is such a thing as a perfect translation that conveys all of the meaning of the original. And I misspelled original, oops. Um, but again, I would say philosophically, no, there's no perfect translation because anytime you go from one language to another, you're going from one cultural context to another. And the even if it's something abstract, like a scientific term or a medical term, there will be certain overtones that are conveyed in one language that are not carried through to the other one. So I would say that every translation is necessarily imperfect, and our job is just to get as close as we can to an accurate and complete translation, which will accomplish the purpose it's supposed to accomplish. And so the context for today's lesson is somebody is trying to get into college, and we're trying to create a complete and accurate translation that conveys what it was they did back in their home country in a way that's useful for what they're trying to do in the United States. So this is all going to be Spanish and English. The example is from Mexico, but it's similar to what you would see in a lot of different countries. And so I'm going to jump into the translation itself, but I would appreciate it if everybody would get into the chat right now and just tell us uh, where you are. I'm curious what country you're in, or if you're in the US, maybe what state that you're in, um, so we can see who's represented here. And that'll help me to, to focus my comments a little better. 
And also, if you're like a translator or an interpreter or a student, you could put that in the comments too. That would be interesting. I know some of you, uh, like Guillermo, are um, professional translators with a lot of years of experience. Um, Guillermo has worked for my company, actually, and does excellent work as a legal translator, perito traductor in Mexico. And then I know some people are just uh, students getting into this. And so you're all welcome at whatever skill level you are. Mexico, San Antonio, Virginia, Baja California, Denver, Ciudad Juarez, La Paz. Cool. All over. Great. So I'm going to share my screen now and put up this document. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see the shared screen, please, because half the time I do this wrong. Thank you. So on the first page, you see the the generic translator certification that I always start with. I like to do it in Spanish and English. You don't have to, but it's nice so that everybody involved in the transaction can read what's going on, even if they only know one of the languages. So in this case, I would change it to certified translation of a Mexican uh, diploma and grade report, or I would describe what the translation is. I put it in both languages over here and here. And let me zoom in since this is probably small on some of your screens. And then I would put my name um, in both of these blanks here. I would sign it, date it, and the contact information could go here or it could go in the footer. On mine, I actually have my company's contact information down in the footer. But if you're a sole proprietor, you could put it under here. And then if it were a translation that needed to be notarized, I already have the notarization statement set up. But since this is a transcript and diploma, nobody needs it notarized, so I'm just going to delete that. And then I'll go down to the first page of the source document. Now, I know there's always somebody who's like really particular at these trainings, and, and, and I'm going to call this a diploma, and it's not technically a diploma. I think it's more like um, I, because the two systems between the countries are not exactly the same, you might not call this a diploma in Mexico. For my purposes, I consider this to be close enough to a diploma that I'm going to translate it that way. So if you disagree, that's fine, because like I said, I don't think there's any one perfect uh, translation that conveys all the meaning without having a ton of uh, translator's notes. And nobody at the university wants to see a ton of translator's notes. This is not a forensic investigation where they're trying to learn about the Mexican educational system. It's just a bureaucrat sitting there trying to process paperwork as fast as possible. So I'm going to split screens now and put the source in the top and the translation in the bottom. So down here at the bottom, we have, um, the space for the translation. And looking across here from left to right, I can see there's sort of a three column format going on. So I'm going to insert a table that is three cells across. And in the far left, I see the seal of Mexico. And so actually, before I even get to that, looking in the background of this document, if you look real close on my screen, I can see that it says Mexico, 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 Sistema Educación, Educativo Nacional, over and over again. And so I want to acknowledge that watermark to show that I'm being complete and accurate. And so I would type something like this, watermark of circular seal of Mexico in center background. And you can barely see that on your screen, but it's right there in the middle. On the original, I can see it better. And then the text in that is United Mexican states, if you want to say that a different way, United States of Mexico, or, you know, this is just my default translation. And then repeated text in background, you could call it security text, watermark text, Mexico, and national educational system, which is how I've chosen to translate Sistema Educativo Nacional national educational system. I just get this watermark stuff out of the way at the very beginning so I don't forget about it. Okay, lots of different ways to handle this. Now I'm going to put in my uh, little table with the three cells and I see on the far left there is a circular seal. I like to call that whoops, circular seal of Mexico. Um, and then the text United Mexican States again. And I've already said this once in the document. And if the same thing appears multiple times on a page, you can just make a note to uh, refer back up to when it appeared before. But in my case, I like to 
um, repeat it so for clarity to make it easier on the person reading this. Then I see the letters SCP really big and under that Secretaria de Educación Pública. I'm going to call that the um, Department of Public Education. You could call it a secretariat. That's a term people know in English, even though it's, we don't use it in the US or the Ministry of Public Education. That's fine too. Um, department just feels uh, the most um, recognizable to me. I'll select all this text and then use the shortcut of control left bracket to make it smaller. I don't want it too small. I want it to be easy to read for whoever gets this, um, but smaller so that it looks more like the original. I'm selecting the SCP, control B to bold it and control right bracket, right square bracket to make it bigger. Um, the stuff right here, I'm going to make that smaller. This is just sort of prettying it up. Don't don't waste much time on the formatting. Nobody really cares. But I like the I like it to be easy to look back and forth between the source and the target, and for anybody without knowing both languages to figure out what text corresponds to what translation. So again, here we have the National Educational System. National Educational. You can call it National Education System too. I'll use the adjective form. Certificados de Estudios. Um, I'm going to call it a diploma. You could call it a certificate of studies. That's fine. That's close enough. I'll select that and make it a little bigger. And then we get down um, to la Secretaría de Educación Pública a través de la Dirección General del Bachillerato. So I'm going to go down below my, my table here and tab over la Secretaría de Educación Pública um, is the the Department of Public Education. Because I translated that that way up in the logo, I'm going to use the same translation now all the way through this document. Don't switch back and forth. That gets confusing for the reader. Um, through the main office of um, high school education. Now, I know there are going to be people on this call who disagree with, with some of my choices here. That's fine. You know. We all have different ways of expressing the same idea, but I feel that La Dirección General del Bachillerato is the head office, the top office in charge of um, people completing their baccalaureate program. And in the US, some people know what a baccalaureate program is or a baccalaureate diploma, but it's not a very common term. And so I feel that high school education is the closest thing that anybody working in a university registrar or admissions office it's going to know, so I like that translation. And a lot of this is just personal preference and best judgment. Then I see that there's a photo of a guy here, and I blurred it out in Photoshop. By the way, all of the names and numbers in this, I Photoshopped them out and changed them so that this isn't recognizable as an actual um, client. And so when I see a picture of a person, um, I'm just going to say a photo of a person and not go into any detail, not try to describe the height and weight and race and sex and all that. Um, then I'll tab over and say, con clave de centro de trabajo. Um, we don't have something exactly like this in the US, but uh, the closest I could come up with is with work center code. And then that's a number assigned by the government to identify a certain entity, in this case, a school. Um, o eight K R L O O O. Nope, only three O's, two T. So make sure you have a proofreader. We can go back, especially, and check for numbers. It's easy to mess up on numbers, long numbers like this. Certify, certify, certifies that um, Fernando Nunez. Notice in the original, there's no accent mark. Um, Mexican documents are like that. Cuban documents will put the accent marks, and certain other countries, I'm sure. Venezuela and Colombia put the accent marks. But when I'm translating into English, I leave them off anyways. Um, now here on the far left, I see there's a rubber stamp on the bottom of that photo. And so it's the same as this uh, thing I translated already up here, Circular Seal of Mexico. So to save time, I'll just copy and paste that down here with Control C and Control V. Um, but I'm also going to mention that it's a rubber stamp this time. It's not something that's printed on the document. So I'll put rubber stamp with Circular Seal of Mexico. Okay, now coming back out here into the middle, um, we have 
con clave única de registro de población. This is a, most of you probably know, this is a, a number, a little bit like a social security number in the U.S. that's issued to all citizens, maybe all residents. Um, so coming back up to my 11 point font, I'm going to call that with, why does this look smaller? This is 11 points. Whoops. Okay, 11, there. I use finer print over there. I'm going to do control C, control B for bold. Um, you know, I, we don't have time to mess with bold, forget that. Uh, but I will use caps lock with unique population registry code. This is how I like to translate PERP. And I'm going to leave the acronym there in Spanish, just like it shows in the original. And space that a little bit for TWCK85460. I don't know if this is an I or a 1. It would matter for legal purposes in Mexico, but if you can't tell if it's an I or one, just compare it to other I's and ones in the document and give it your, use your best judgment. Acredito. Uh, acredito is a very concise Spanish verb that doesn't translate well into the cognate of credited. So don't say he credited the um, high school diploma because, or, or accredited. It sounds like accredited, but in the US accredited is only something that a governing body can give to a lower organization like my degree at UTRGV was accredited through a council of universities. Students can't be accredited in the US. They can receive credit for a class they take. They can receive credit for a degree. So you have to sort of play around with the form of the verb here. And so um, the way I think that this would be most uh, easily and clearly and quickly understood in English is just that he earned it. He earned a high school diploma. And you might say, well, that's not exactly the same as the Spanish, acredito el bachillerato general. So technically, what happens here is that he earned credit for a general baccalaureate. And if you want to be super precise, say it that way, that's fine. Um, I just feel that's unnecessarily complicated um, and might um, cause delays in the processing as the recipient tries to research what it means to earn credit for a general baccalaureate. So in virtud de que demostró contar con los conocimientos correspondientes is just ridiculously complicated way to say this because it's a legal document so they want to sound real fancy. And so you've got to make the English sound kind of fancy to uh, preserve the register, the level of formality. Um, so I'm going to say for having demonstrated that he has the appropriate knowledge and then con base en el acuerdo um, based on agreement number 286 of the uh, uh, del ciudadano secretario here we've gone from la secretaria the organization to el secretario the person the guy in this case was in charge of it so i'm going to call him the secretary of public education. And in the US, there's lots of government offices that have a secretary who is the director, who is the leader. So that, that transfers well culturally. The secretary of public education on, remember, L becomes on when it comes to dates, September 21st, 2017. If you want to put it in the, in the Mexican order, 21 September 2017, that's not wrong. It's just a little more common to put it in this order in US documents. Then over here on the left, I see there's some more text I need to add underneath that um, rubber stamp. And I would actually have put this in tables if I weren't doing it fast for an audience, but I'm just gonna use tabs and spaces to save time here. So we have SCP and then underneath that, um, we're calling it the Department, what is that, eight point Department of Public Education. And so that's not formatted exactly the same, but it conveys all the same information. So it's good enough for government work. I used to work for the government. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Got a lot to cover here. So the next thing that I see is um, the, the grade results for his um, 
I don't know what you call it, his final exam, his comprehensive exam, his um, uh, baccalaureate exam. And so I'm going to change the format a little bit and just put a result of the evaluation, you could say of the exam, 8.0, and then write it out in words, 8.0. You can put boxes around it if you want. I'll add spaces at least so it stands out a little bit more. El presente documento, there is some precedent in English legalese for saying the present document, but it's, it's unusual. It's much less common than in Spanish. So I like to translate this as this document. It's a little lower register, but it conveys the same meaning. This document is issued. In English, we would say was issued. It's changing the tense, but it means the same thing. Was issued in Jalapa, Veracruz, where I've been, and it's a lovely city, and I miss it. I've been to Veracruz in too long. Um, on 21 días del mes de septiembre de 2017, I don't like to put it in that order because it's um, not what you'd expect on the corresponding English document. I'm going to switch it around September and put numerals, which is the norm. On September 21st, uh, 2017. Now, a lot of people will legitimately uh, disagree with me on this part and say, no, it's written out in words in Spanish, write it out in words in English. And I feel like it's so unimportant that I would rather make it clear and understandable for the bureaucrat or the admissions officer who's receiving this to, because we rarely write out dates and words in English. So did I get the date right? September 21st, 2017, yes. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to translate folio as page um, RMD229. 54329. If you have the time and want to make it look fancy and put a box around it, make, you can even make it red like in the original. You can make it as correspond as closely as floats your boat. Whatever makes you happy, that's fine. Over here where I see a signature, I've blurted out for privacy purposes. I'm just going to put signature. I'm not going to try to read it or guess whether it's the actual person. That's not my job. Uh, I am going to put his name, Martin to Talasco, Anaya, and for licenciado, um, since there's not an exact equivalent in the U.S., I like to translate this as licensed professional. I don't know what his licenciatura is in. I can't guess if it's a, if it's a lawyer or, or an architect. No, I guess it's an arquitecto, but there's lots of different licenciaturas in different fields. And so I just simplify it as a professional who has a license from the government to do some profession. And then underneath, Jefe de Departamento de Control Escolar, that sounds to me like what we would probably call the supervisor of the Department of the Registrar. Now, let's say you're one of the attendees who's in Mexico who has never gone to a university in the U.S. and you're not sure, what do they call that person who does this job? If you can do some research online, I would recommend PROS. The forums on PROS, P-R-O-Z dot com, are a good place to get really specific um, uh, language. Uh, word reference forums are pretty good for that too. Or you, maybe you'd go to the website of the university that your client is applying to and just dig through the departments and find out what that person's called. That takes a while. Um, but after after you've done a lot of these, you start to get a feel for um, the, uh, with experience, it just becomes easier to get a feel for what the corresponding uh, job is at the other, in the other country's educational system. So you could, if you're not sure, you can put the chief of the Department of Academic Control. That wouldn't be wrong. That would just sound a little bit uh, unusual to a lot of readers in the US. Here on the left, I like to describe when, it's, uh, when the text is at a funny angle. I like to describe so that you know what you're looking at vertically in left margin. I'll put that fine print there. Even though it's really small, you have to include it. You can't just leave out stuff that's, that's small. Sometimes you have to zoom in on the PDF or on the original to be able to read it. And then here we have this real fine print at the bottom. Este documento de certificación. I'm going to say this. All caps. This certification document is valid in the United Mexican States and does not require additional legalization processing. It took me a long time to figure out how to handle the word trámites 
because tramite doesn't have an exact equivalent in English. It's a good word. Like I wish we had the word tramite because it's so useful. But processing is, is pretty close. It means the things that some official has to do in order to make it uh, valid. So no es válido en los Estados Unidos Mexicanos y no requiere, no es válido, uh, y no requiere trámites adicionales de legalización. So that's the most concise way I've come up with to say that very common warning that's at the bottom of a lot of documents. Okay, I'm going to take a brief pause to drink my water and check the questions. Oh, good, we've got some questions here. Um, since we're halfway through, we're going to do the grade report next. Let's see. Oh, good. People from all over. Lots is from Mexico. Cool. Um, we will send a video out. Like on Monday, I'll email everybody who signed up for this and send you a link to the YouTube version of this if you're having trouble or if you aren't able to stay the whole time. Would it be necessary to add a note regarding the grading scale? I would say only if you see that note in the original. Um, like in this case, I don't see anywhere uh, a scale saying um, what the maximum score is. About half the time you will have one, but I would hesitate to add that if I don't know. Um, all right, any other questions before we go on to the grade report? We're making pretty good time. I feel like we should stop for a commercial break. Okay, I'm gonna show you my commercial here. I just made this video and I'm super proud of it. I want everybody to say, cool video. This is my, uh, this is my project that I'm working on interviewing people from all over the world. Okay, so this is my uh, Texan Means Friendly campaign for Texan translation. And I've, I've talked to people from Russia and Gabon, Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, France. Uh, and I've done uh, one more that's not on here yet. But if any of you watching the show, watching the show, watching this um, webinar, live in Texas and are from a country not represented there and you want to let me interview to like, about your experiences moving to Texas, uh, hit me up afterwards and I would love to add you to the, the interview series. It's just a, an informal thing to find out about the different communities that live here in Texas and what, what brings people here. Okay, share screen, next half, uh, not that one. Sharing my Word document, there it is. So for the next half, um, this is kind of a, it's not a report card per se, but everybody who comes in applying for college has a couple of different pages and you never know what you're going to get. And in this one, the client who's applying for a community college in the U.S. brought us this document called the Reporte Individual de Resultados. And so I'm going to demonstrate how we translated that one. So starting at the top, I see this kind of a letterhead and it looks like the kind of thing that would be useful to use a table in. Uh, there are, mm, I'm gonna treat this as three cells going across. So first I see a logo. So I put logo in square brackets and, and square brackets are how I indicate a translator's note that is not in the original. And then I see Centro Nacional de Evaluación para la Educación Superior AC. And I believe that ASE is an Asociación Civil, which is like a nonprofit association. And so there's, there's no exact uh, equivalent to that under our legal system here, but I'm gonna call it the National, let's see, looking at my notes here, National Evaluation Center for Higher Education Nonprofit corporation or nonprofit organization. That's probably the closest we could get concisely in U.S. English. And then underneath Ceneval is the, the abbreviation. I'm going to make this smaller just so it looks a little bit more like the original and takes up less space. Drag this column over. 
And then we have, uh, again, uh, this organization name, Ceneval. And then their slogan, una institución especialmente, esencialmente humana. I'll call that an essentially, how do you spell essentially? Uh, one, uh, essentially human organization. A lot of universities will have their slogan in Latin. And unless you know Latin, you really shouldn't be translating the Latin into English. And so I would just say Latin slogan and then type again in Latin what it is that you see there. And if you if you know Latin or if you Google it and find out what it is in English, you can put that. But put the English in brackets because remember, you are the Spanish to English translator. You're not the Spanish and Latin to English translator. And personally, I have, I have no qualifications for translating Latin, even individual slogans. Okay, now up here at the top, I see evaluation of the process for earning high school equivalency credit. Now, I went back and forth on how to say this because I've messed around with the grammar here so it sounds more natural in English. It's actually evaluation of the process of earning credit of knowledge or understanding equivalent to the general baccalaureate. And if you want to be that um, exact, that literal, you can. That's not wrong, but it's just confusing. And so I would, I would just sort of like wave my magic uh, idiomatic wand over it and come up with this. I feel this conveys essentially the same meaning and it's much more understandable. Uh, individual report of results, or you could call that individual. I do know how to spell individual. The problem is when you have caps lock on, sometimes the, uh, the spell check doesn't run um, unless you have set that in Word. Individual report of results, you call it the report of individual results, same thing. I'm going to make that bold so it looks more like the original. And then this doesn't go all the way across, but I'm going to just for simplicity and say, con base en el acuerdo secretarial, based, based on departmental, and because I translated secretaria, secretaria as department before, I'm going to stick with that verbiage agreement to 86 and its modification on 4 to 2012 here you see that i have understood through looking at the whole document that um, this original uses the traditional mexican uh, day month year order but I'm putting it in the month day year order. And if you're if you're uncomfortable doing that, then just spell out the month. Call it uh, for um, February 2012 to make sure that there's no confusion. And if you're not sure, if, the, if it, there's only one date in the whole order and you're not sure, because there are some places in Latin America where they use the month day year order. Um, and if you're not sure, then just leave it in the exact same order as you found and let the person receiving it try to decide what date that was if it's important. Or you can talk to your client, whoever placed the order with you, and say, um, can you help me research the, the date order and confirm that this is the month and this is the day, or this is the day and this is the month. But usually it's, it's clear from the context. Um, emitido, I use issued by the Department of Public Education, and then I keep the same acronym as in Spanish, SEP. I don't try to create a new non-existent acronym in English. The National Evaluation Center for Higher Education, CENEVAL, and you, uh, I'm using the original capitalization, just capitalizing the first letter on there, even though um, it's, an un it's unusual. Never mind. I won't get into that. Issued this. Um, these results. It's singular in the Spanish, expide el presente resultado, but I would never say that in English, this is the result. I would always say these results because it's more than one grade in a single report. That's just an idiomatic choice. Issued these results from the evaluation process for earning high school equivalency credit. And if you want to say that a little bit differently, feel free. You're the translator. And remember, translators are writers. 
All we're doing is writing a document in the target language based on what we read in the source language. And as writers, we have a certain poetic license to express things however we feel makes the most sense and sounds right. And it's not a science. Uh, I feel like this next little section would be best represented as a table. So I'm going to create a quick uh, two column, four row table and then drag this over and then use right justification on these on this first column here. So I select them all and hit control R to write justify. And then I'm going to type in page name exam or examination, either one, uh, date of no effective date. At first I thought of using um, date of application, but I think uh, effective date is closer to the meaning of the original. RND 229452293299. RMD 229543299. Yeah, I'm not so good with the numbers. Fernando Nunez Carizales. And then I see this is the same exam as was already mentioned. Um, so I'm going to select it here, Control C to copy, then click here, Control V to paste it. But because it's all capitalized, I'll select it again and go up to the bar. I don't know if you can see on the screen here, but select uppercase, and that instantly converts the whole thing to capital letters. And I just like, if it's capitals in one, I usually make it capitals in the other, except for French into English. They capitalize odd things. Date 7-15-2017. I don't like to use the initial zero before the seven. Um, it's kind of a stylistic choice. So I drop out the zero. It's still the same date. That's fine. And then down here, I'm going to center this global grade. Nobody in English in the US at least says global grade. We say overall. And so I'm calling this the overall grade colon. Put a few spaces in there and then 8.0. And I'm using a desktop computer here with a full size keyboard that has the numeric keypad on the right. If you're working on a little laptop keyboard, that's fine. But um, the more numbers that you deal with, especially in a transcript, the nicer it is to have the numeric keypad over there. And it's a lot quicker to type and transcribe those. Uh, I would also like to put in a plug for big uh, monitors too. My, my monitor right here. I don't know if you can see this, it's about this wide and this high. It's, it's like more than a landscape format. It's, it's like cinematic aspect ratio or something, but it's great because you can have the source here, the target here, and then a browser open here for doing your research and you're just glancing back and forth and you don't have to click between different windows. So invest, if you're a student, invest early in a large monitor and a full-size keyboard. Um, the following table shows the points earned in each disciplinary field, period. And then we have a little table here. I see two columns and one, two, really, we only need two columns and two rows to represent this. Um, so campo disciplinar, I like disciplinary field for that, a very literal translation. Puntaje, we don't have a word pointage in English. I would use points, the plural, the noun. Points obtained, and I'm going to capitalize both of those words because it's a it's title case in, in English. And then here I'll hit control L to left justify. Um, you can use um, mathematics, but math is a much more common way to say that. Um, experimental science, you can use experimental sciences, but it's commonly called science in the singular in English. So I'm just making these little adjustments for readability. Humanities, we do use the plural of that. Social sciences, again, um, that's usually pluralized is from my experience. Um, I don't know if you here, here's the thing. Let's say you're Spanish dominant, you're translating into English and you're not sure what is the most common way to express this. Do people say social sciences or do they say social science? There's an easy way to solve that. 
you type it into Google with quotation marks around it both ways and you search social science singular in quotation marks and you see how many hits you get and then you add an S and you search again social sciences and you see how many hits you get and then you sort of scan down the page and make sure that it's the right language in the right country in the right context but if social sciences gets 834 hits and social science gets 12,328 hits then you know oh this one's um, in general the more common one and that'll give you a little uh rule of thumb to feel comfortable uh, translating it one way or the other when they are roughly equivalent but one is the uh, idiomatic norm uh, communications communicative abilities uh, or just uh, communication communicative abilities ability communicative ability I, I like that that feels right to me 1200 and it's going to appear five times so I'll select it um, Hit enter, control V, control V, control V. Use your control C and your control V to your advantage. The other most important shortcut for this kind of work is um, control H, which is for search and replace. And anytime you go through a, a big document and you realize, oh, I've been using the wrong term and I want to search and replace all the way through, control H will save you having to dig it out and find it. Uh, answer just in the chat uh, for habilidad. Yes, habilidad can be... Uh, translated the skills that's fine now we have this text across the bottom to i'm going to left justify this control l to lograr una calificación aprobatoria i'm going to call that to earn a passing grade um, a student must receive and I'm, you'll see i'm playing around with the syntax here just for idiomatic purposes a student must receive credit in the five disciplinary fields the minimum or you could say minimal the minimum point value required to pass each field is 1000 points la puntuación mínima requerida para acreditar again we have this verb acreditar which is so handy in spanish that we just we have to sort of shoehorn it into the english to to make it sound natural Para acreditar cada campo es de mil puntos. And the de is non-essential grammatically in English. So that becomes, to pass each field is 1,000 points. I'm going to hit enter here to follow the formatting and say a continuación. And this is, I'm going to do a lot of uh, juggling of the syntax here, just moving pieces of the sentence to a different place so that it's clearer in English. And you'll see, I hope you can see both the original. Let me zoom in a little and the final version to see what I'm talking about. It's just an awkward word order in from the English speaker's perspective. So I'm going to say the points received on the reading comprehension exam and the written expression and reasoning abilities exam are shown below for reference. For the latter, the score earned for each section is specified. Para este último se especifica el puntaje alcanzado en cada rubro. Rubro isn't exactly section, but it sounded right to me. I'm going to check the chat, see if any questions. Credit is commonly singular. Um, we use credit and credits in different contexts. Um, I talk about credit being received for an exam or the credits you earned in college. Um, this class, I got three credits in this class, but I received credit for the class. It has a slightly different meaning, but they're both common on uh, transcripts. And if you're not sure which one to use, either one would probably be fine. <laughs> Those of you who are taking translation classes, I can see you. I can see getting emails from your instructors after this and be like, "You're too flexible. They're not all fine. There's a right and a wrong way to do this." Sorry, that's just my philosophy. Okay, I'm going to make another little table here and call this exam and points earned centered. Here we have the campos, campos dis disciplinarios, was it? I forgot. Let's justify. Uh, reading comprehension. 
Um, I'm going to call this written expression and reasoning abilities. Habilidades de expresión y argumentativa escritas. When you have a noun adjective, a noun adjective in one language, it's sometimes hard to know which nouns go with which adjectives in the other languages. But here, habilidades de expresión, reasoning abilities, and I put it second in my translation, I guess. It would be a little bit better to put that first. Reasoning abilities and written expression. Y argumentativa escritas. You can say written argumentation. Um, uh, I don't. I don't like this translation. I'm gonna work. Th I'm gonna work through this again live. Habilidades de expresión. Um, expressive oh, expression skills and written reasoning. So it's not an exact translation, but we don't really have exactly this type of exam in in the US that I'm aware of. So I feel like that is a good compromise. And if you have a different way to say that, feel free. Begin with written. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, spelling. There is a word orthography in English, but it's very high register and it would be unusual in this context. Um, vocabulary. Syntax, organización discursiva, I call that logical organization. You could call it discursive organization. Again, that's an unusually high register word in English. Um, you could also use the same round bullets on here if you want to. I don't think it's really important. Uh, 1225, 1225, 1200, 1200, 1200. Now I'm going to go through and, oh, there's one about that, 1,200. Now I'm going to make sure these line up. Yep, yep, those line up. Okay. Now we're down out of the table. Consulte la página. Um, usually we say that visit the web page of the main office of high school education. It's come up before in this document that I called the Dirección General something else earlier. Dirección General, not on this page, maybe the first page. Dirección General. I don't see, I don't think that office has been mentioned. Oh, yeah, here it is. Dirección General del, del Bachillerato. And so before I call that the main office of high school education, so I want to be consistent, I'm going to use that again. The main office of high school. Okay, good. And then if it's a URL, you want to just type it exactly the same. Of course, you don't translate anything inside of a URL. And then often Word will try to tr turn your underline your URL and turn it blue, but it's not underlined in the original, and so I always hit Control Z at that point to remove the hyperlink to un-underline it. Information regarding the submission and validation of this of the certificate of the certificate. This is the web page of the main office of high school education. HTTPS. Whoops. Acuerdo 286.go.mex.legal para obtener información relacionada con la entrega y validación del certificado. Okay, that sounds pretty close to me. Then we have an address down here. You can put it in a box if you want to make it look more like that. I'm not going to bother, but I'm going to make the font a little smaller. Uh, AV, we all know, stands for Avenida, but because it's an abbreviation in Spanish that the English reader might be confused about. Um, I always like to extend all abbreviations into the full word. So I'm going to say, Avenido Camino al Desierto de los Leones, Alta Vista, 19, Colonia, the same thing. I'm going to expand that abbreviation. San Angel, I'm not going to put the accent mark on Angel. 
Um, if you wanted to, you could translate some of these words like avenida, put in square brackets, avenue. You could even translate uh, road of the desert of the lions, but nobody really cares. You know, they, just, they know it's an address. If you want to, if you don't want to confuse your recipient, just put address right here in brackets so they know, oh, this is an address. It's not important. Delegacion. It's not important, but on the other hand, you can't just omit it entirely. Delegación Álvaro Obregón, Código Postal, México, Ciudad de México. And anytime it says tel, you can translate that as, telef as um, telephone. I like to say phone because that's what most people call it now. Nobody says telephone hardly in English anymore, the whole word. Uh, LADA. LADA is an unfamiliar Mexican acronym that's not going to mean anything to the American reader. So I'm going to translate. I'm going to put, I'm going to leave LADA there, but then in square brackets say long distance because that LADA means long distance, right? It's an, it's an abbreviation for something having to do with long distance. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, sin costo. Um, that is not part of the address, that's text. So I'm going to translate that in English toll free, 01-800-624-2510. And now I'm done with my translation. Um, the next step is for me to proof it and then to, for me to send it to somebody else to proofread it. And I would highly encourage you as just a matter of professional practice to always proofread your own work, to go back through the whole thing and ideally Put a finger on the Spanish and put a finger on the English and go through and make sure you didn't skip anything or make any dumb mistakes and then send it to your your partner or your spouse or your coworker or your buddy or somebody um, who's also a professional translator or at least who is bilingual and a stickler for details and have that person translate it too. Because you if everybody makes mistakes, but we want to catch our mistakes before it goes out to the client and then we're embarrassed because they send it back and there's something wrong with it. So I'm going to tweak the um, the formatting a little bit here. I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, I like to say left blank intentionally seen texto so that when they get all this white space here, they're not confused about what's supposed to go there. Um, I can see that I have it twice on here, so I'll delete that one and bring this second source document up a little bit higher. And then at the end, I put end of translation, fin de la traducción, because uh, on rare occasion, a client will hire you to do a translation and they'll just pay for one page and then they'll go home and they'll translate the rest and staple it to the end of yours to save money, which is unavoidable. You know, some people are are going to do that. But if you put end of end of translation at the end of yours, then it makes a clear indication of where your work ended and anything after that is you're not responsible for. I'm also going to clean up this uh, table a little bit here. I can see that I created a table for arrangement purposes, but there's no visible table in the original. So I'll select all that and hit no border. So it looks more like that. And then I would proof it. And then I would probably tweak the formatting a little bit, you know, like maybe put in some extra spaces here so it's more readable. So it looks more like the original just to pretty it up. And then make sure that my pagination is correct, fill out my translator certification, and then send it off to the proofreader. In a case like this, as far as um, invoicing goes, if an individual who I don't know places the order with me, I always charge the full amount up front because um, I don't know if they're going to pay or not after I've done the work. So I would charge. They could come in and pay in person in cash or check, or more often now they're going to be dealing with me by email. And so I'm sending them an invoice to a credit card processing service, and they pay with their credit or debit card. And then once they've paid, I produce the Word version of the translation after it's proofed and finalized, I will export it as a PDF and send it to the client and say, here is the draft of your translation. I want you to look over it and approve it before we finalize it. Because sometimes, you know, often the person is bilingual and maybe they have their own opinion. They're like, oh, I see that you translated this as high school diploma, but I prefer that you say baccalaureate. And I'll do some research and say, you know, I feel like baccalaureate is just as good of a translation. And if that's their preference, then I can, in good conscience, translate it either way, and I want them to be happy with the translation. If they have, if they want, if they say I want you to translate it as associate's degree <laughs> or something that's clearly inaccurate, then I, I won't make that concession. But I like to give them a chance to review it, and then once they've approved it, send it back to me. I'll finalize it and either 
um, put my signature and date in here electronically and export it as a PDF and send it to them if that's what they've requested or if they want a paper copy and have paid extra for that, then I'll print it up and uh, mail it to them where they'll come by and pick it up. So that's the whole process of doing a representative um, diploma uh, 